Life will continually push the boundaries of its own mortality, adapting to survive, reaching to heal. Faster, stronger, better. Every day, the seeds of our imaginations are growing into the medicine of the future. It is a miracle of evolution, an extraordinary composite of smaller parts designed and crafted by Mother Nature. When the human body becomes damaged or worn out, Mother Nature can make some repairs herself. Sometimes, however, vital organs and tissue are beyond her power to repair. But what if we could help Mother Nature by reconditioning damaged tissue or transplanting organs with no fear of rejection. What if we could turn to Mother Nature's other offspring, plants, animals, and insects, to help us develop new and improved medical tools and treatments? Or mimic Mother Nature herself by manufacturing brand new tissue from a single cell? You are looking at the future the innovators and decision makers of tomorrow. Some will be doctors, some will be scientists, some will be involved in technologies yet to be discovered, and some will be diagnosed with diabetes. There are presently some 60,000 new cases of diabetes diagnosed in Canada every year. It is estimated that almost a million and a half Canadians have the disease and these numbers are expected to increase as the population continues to age. This team of researchers in Edmonton, Alberta, however, are currently pioneering a new treatment that could one day cure type 1 diabetes. Its focus is on treating the disease using the body's lowest common denominator, the cell. In this case, a cell called an islet. Located across the back of the abdomen behind the stomach, the pancreas helps in the digestion of food, breaking it down into energy that can be used by the body. It is home to one million tiny islet cells, each smaller than a grain of sand. When working properly, special beta cells within these islets produce insulin, a hormone that regulates the amount of sugar in the bloodstream. The clever thing about the islet is that it's there, listening to the blood sugar all the time, feeling it. And when you eat your meal, as soon as your sugar goes up just a fraction, well, the, the, the islet senses that immediately and pops out a bit more insulin, and the blood sugar comes back. With type 1 diabetes, however, this delicate balance is upset. Doctors believe that, for some reason, the patient's own immune system destroys these beta cells, causing the islets in the pancreas to stop producing insulin. Blood sugar builds to dangerous levels, causing fatigue, weight loss, nausea and vomiting, even coma, seizures and death. Presently, there is no cure for the disease. It must be managed with daily injections of insulin. Blood sugar levels must be constantly monitored, often on an hourly basis. Since she was 19, Kathy Chappette has suffered from an acute form of the type 1 disease known as brittle diabetes. I would have to test before I went on the bus because I didn't want it to drop when I was on the bus all by myself, before I went grocery shopping, before I drove the car. Diabetes controls your life when you're a brittle diabetic because no matter what you do, the diabetes comes first, no matter what you do. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Dr. Shapiro. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? But life for Kathy may one day change, particularly since being chosen by Edmonton researchers as a candidate for an innovative new treatment called islet transplantation. So, the idea of putting the islet transplant in is to make the body near normal again. 
so that the insulin's coming from within rather than being injected on the outside. Transplantation of the entire pancreas already provides many patients with freedom from insulin injection. But it is major invasive surgery with all the accompanying risks. Islet transplantation involves just the transfer of the insulin producing cells themselves. The procedure requires only a local anesthetic and takes about an hour. The treatment begins with the collection of healthy islets in this state-of-the-art laboratory. While researchers hope to eventually grow the tissues themselves, the best resource to date is organ donation. The islets only make up less than 3% of the total mass of the pancreas. So we've had to develop techniques for basically picking the needles out of the haystack. Those techniques begin with an enzyme that breaks down the pancreas. The resulting tissues are then put through a number of separating procedures isolating those islets that survive the process. The process itself takes between 8 to 12 hours from the time the organ receives is received in our laboratory to the time we have the islets ready for clinical transplantation. On average, a healthy pancreas will yield half a million islets. Although separated from their host organ, these life-giving tissues can still produce insulin and are ready for transplantation. Since the process of transplanting islets is still experimental, potential recipients are limited to those diabetics most in need. Today we're only picking the patients that have the most severe forms of type 1 diabetes, in other words those patients that have very dangerous lows in their blood sugar or rapid swings from high to low to high to low. With her acute form of the disease, Kathy Chappette is an ideal candidate. Your heart's just racing because, like, so much uncertainty, too. So it was, uh, yeah, it was very nerve-wracking, <laughs> but exciting at the same time. Gail Thorborn has also been accepted for treatment. Like Kathy, Gail's brittle diabetes leaves her vulnerable to sudden plunges in blood sugar levels, known as undiagnosed lows. And that was my answer actually to one of the doctors. He said, if I could change anything um, and give you anything from the transplant, what would that be? And my answer to him was the undiagnosed lows. If you can get rid of those, I could probably function a lot better, even with diabetes. The transplantation procedure begins with a routine exam. Then x-ray and ultrasound are used to help guide a tube inside the patient's abdomen. At this stage, however, there is a remarkable twist. Although the islet's natural home is the pancreas, that organ is now avoided. It's not easy to put cells back in the pancreas, and there are many complications that could happen to a patient when we start fiddling with the pancreas, and that can occasionally be dangerous for a patient. The liver is chosen instead, due to its resilience and excellent blood supply. The tube is maneuvered into place inside the liver's main portal vein. The harvested islets are then allowed to flow freely from an IV solution directly into their new organ. Then the islets are going to come up into the liver and then go to both sides of it and settle out all over it like uh, little grains of sand. They're beginning to nest and make their new home inside the liver. Once established, the islets immediately sense the sugar content of their new blood supply and start producing insulin. Patients receiving islets need to take strong anti-rejection drugs to prevent the body's immune system from attacking the new tissue. But for the patient with brittle diabetes, it's a small price to pay, especially when the results exceed their greatest expectations. The most defining moment in my life has to be when I sat on the end of the bed after that second transplant and didn't have to take insulin. That was and still is an unbelievable moment for me in my life. Can you imagine, we're talking 26 years of you know, basically four needles a day. How many needles is that? That's thousands of needles. And then waking up one day, February 1st, and going, I, 
I don't have to take a needle. It's not, it's not something I knew. It was unbelievable. Because it had been at least five years since I'd felt a low blood sugar. And it was like, oh my gosh, that's when, when I felt like I was getting my life back. We reached a, quite a milestone recently in terms of the number of transplants we've done when we hit number 50. At the one year time point, 82% of our patients are completely free of insulin. Cheers. Uh. Mm. The numbers are promising, but scientists must deal with one key issue before the treatment becomes widely available. The problem of keeping up the islet supply strictly through organ donation. There are clearly not enough organ donors to meet the need of all those diabetics in Canada and around the world that would benefit from a clinical islet transplant. That may change in the future, particularly if islets could be grown right in the lab, bypassing the need for donors altogether. To achieve this goal, researchers are focusing on something called embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are premature cells that develop into specialized tissues in the human body. They begin as nonspecific cells with the potential to mature into any cell type. This amazing versatility gives them the potential for important therapeutic applications in the future. At the, at the current time, there are already protocols and, and procedures and other tissue transplants where a small biopsy of skin can be taken. That biopsy is then grown in an incubator and you can develop sheets of your own skin that is used in wound healing and in burn victims. Stem cell technology has an even greater potential. If, for example, stem cells could be programmed to become islet cells of the pancreas, then they could be harvested in the laboratory on a large scale. Then we will have an unlimited source of tissue. The concept is there and is currently being evaluated in the research laboratory. I mean, my dream would be patient comes to my office, has just been diagnosed with diabetes. In the very same day, I write a prescription and off they go and get their islet transplant uh, injection and they're done, they're treated and it won't come back again. It is a dream that researchers want to turn into reality. If growing pancreatic islets and other human tissue is possible, why not the cultivation of entire organs, new hearts, kidneys, eyes, each readily available and tailored to suit individual needs. But first, science must find a way to prevent the body's own defense mechanisms from rejecting that new organ or tissue, no matter what its source. The answer may already be within our grasp. The ability to transplant material from one human being to another is an amazing achievement of medicine and technology. Yet even when transplantation occurs, success is not guaranteed. What often stands in the way is the power of the body's own defense mechanisms. Anything foreign to you, your immune system will attack it and try to eliminate it. We have to use some form of immunosuppression. Immunosuppression, what does it mean? Is simply medications or biological agents that we can use to subdue the immune system. Christian Dujardin knows firsthand how effective the body's immune system can be. Diagnosed with kidney failure when he was a senior in high school, he underwent dialysis treatment for six and a half years before he finally received a kidney transplant. Although he was grateful to be chosen, it was far from being a cure. It's not your own kidney. This kidney is always going to be wanted to be rejected because the body realizes it's, it's foreign and it wants to fight against it. As soon as I got my transplant, I was put on these uh, anti-rejection drugs and I've been on them for 10 years. Chris stopped taking anti-rejection drugs when his transplanted kidney ultimately shut down. The organ's failure not only put him back on daily dialysis, but on the waiting list for a new kidney. I probably spend about 10 hours a day on dialysis right now. It starts in the evening and it goes till tomorrow in the morning, at six o'clock in the morning. Waiting for a transplant is emotional because you don't know when you're gonna get it. Maybe you'll never get it. 
The wait was shorter than expected. Chris found a donor practically in his own backyard, his younger brother, Simon. Christian was the guy who taught me how to play basketball. Christian was the guy that taught me how to swim. Um, Christian was the guy that taught me how to drive. The decision, it wasn't as hard as people think it was because it is an actual, it's somebody that you look up to, it's a brother. Seeing him sick and if it's something that I can do, um, I, I'll, I'll give up my kidney for him. When my brother first came to me and offered me a kidney, I was quite shocked. He was the one that, con that contacted the transplant team and said that he would want to uh, donate a kidney. At that time, they found out that the blood match, the blood type match, but my antibodies would, would reject his kidney right away. They told him that, no, we can't, it won't work. For people that have, that have had um, um, a lot of blood product or have had a previous transplant, re-transplanting them becomes very difficult because they build up antibodies because they've got antibodies from somebody else, from another organ or from a blood transfusion. So the issue and the dilemma is that you may have about 30% of patients waiting on transplant list who may have antibodies. And those people, you literally cannot transplant them because these antibodies will attack immediately the newer graft and then they lose it. The news is a shock for both Chris and Simon, but not their last chance. A procedure used in Europe for the last 10 years could be the answer to both their prayers. It is called immunoabsorption, and unlike dialysis, which removes toxins from the blood, this procedure is designed to remove the antibodies that stand in Chris's way. Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon is one of the few places in North America conducting research on the treatment. The procedures that we have developed here is we take the blood out of the individual, let it circulate on a special column. Column is basically a, special, a specialized protein material that will remove these antibodies. Chris's blood is drawn into a machine called a plasma spinner that separates his red blood cells from his plasma and returns the cells back into his bloodstream. Then the plasma is treated to remove the antibodies that could cause problems following a transplant. Over in this machine, what it's gonna do is take the plasma and run it through these columns, first the A column, then the B column, and what it does is it takes the bad antibodies out of the plasma, because that's where the antibodies are stored, and then we're gonna give it back to the patient. The immunoabsorption treatment takes about five hours to process approximately five liters of plasma before it is transferred back into Chris's body. It is done in conjunction with another treatment designed to prevent the immune system from producing more bad antibodies after they are removed. Blood proteins called immunoglobulins are pooled from the blood of healthy donors and transfused into the patient. So by infusing this immune globulin, you can re-educate the immune system. And by doing this, the immune system may in fact stop making those antibodies. What's unique here really, that's different from elsewhere, is we do not give any immunosuppressive drugs. Good actually relief from some of the pills that yeah. you may have to yeah, take. Yeah, that'd be good, that's good. Very good. And then it allows to re-educate the immune system in a more physiological way. What Dr. Shoker and his colleague hope to achieve is a successful cross-match between Chris's blood and that of his brother Simon. You put donor blood and recipient blood together in a tube and you mix it and you see if it, if it clumps or it doesn't clump. And if it doesn't clump, that's a negative cross-match and we want a negative cross-match. We want it not to clump because if it clumps, that's what's going to happen when we put a kidney in from somebody else, is the blood supply is going to clump, not deliver a blood supply to the kidney. The chance for it to be working is in the neighborhood of about 30%. That's very good, because if we do not remove these antibodies, you literally will have no chance to get transplanted in the future. So would you consider that? As with the transplant itself, there is no guarantee that the treatment will succeed, but it certainly increases the odds at this stage, that's all the Dujardin family can ask for.
If it's anything that gives myself and my brother hope that he can get a new kidney, um, I'll do it. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are in my shoes that are very happy as well that all these experiments are going on because it, it just gives you more hope. Well, hopefully his, his antibody, his bad antibodies will be lowered to the point that he will be an acceptable match for, to receive a transplant from his brother. Um, that would be the ideal outcome. Of course, there's a lot of ifs. Regardless of the outcome, we'll make the best of whatever happens. Oh, yeah. If he needs to stand dialysis, then, then so be it. You know, we're used to dealing with that, and, you know, and we'll just try and keep him as healthy as possible for as long as possible. In the future, we would hope that this treatment would become much more commonly used, possibly not only for kidney transplants, but in the future the hope is to use it for other transplant candidates such as heart, who may, not be, who may have high levels of antibodies because they've had so many blood products in the past. So it can change the lives of a lot of people if it can be used more extensively. What is important for us now is to prove the point. The immune system is like anything in life. It can be educated at different levels. So it may stop making antibodies, but could also be re-educated to make better antibodies. If that happens, there is no question that that would have a major impact on the way how we transplant patients in the future. Hand in hand with that possibility is the prospect of a world where potential donors like Simon Dujardin won't have to risk their own health in the future. A world where human organs would be available in unlimited supply. More than 3,000 Canadians are currently waiting for transplant operations. Unfortunately, the demand far outweighs the supply of donor organs and tissue. But imagine a technology that could grow a brand new organ using a patient's own cells. As far-fetched as it sounds, Scientists are already working toward a future where laboratory-grown organs will be available right off the shelf. Artificial organs ideally will be off-the-shelf materials. Wouldn't it be wonderful if someone with heart disease could simply come to the doctor and get a new heart? The kinds of organs that would be available off the shelf could be almost anything. I mean, we're working on hearts, livers, kidneys, skin, bone, cartilage, are all organs that we envision being available off the shelf. At the University of Toronto, scientists have joined efforts in a program called LIFE that promises new hope for people like Chris Dujardin. It involves a new frontier of medical science called regenerative medicine and may one day make organ transplants as we know them a thing of the past. LIFE stands for Living Implants from Engineering. The LIFE initiative was created a few years ago in order to address the donor organ shortage and to create an unlimited supply of organs by, by tissue engineering. The salamander or the lizard who can rejuvenate its tail or limb, that's really what we'd like to be able to do, and humans can't do that. What's so exciting about regenerative medicine is that we're no longer just trying to treat an injury, we're trying to overcome an injury or overcome a defect or a disorder. There's the potential in regenerative medicine to change the way we deliver medicine. Regenerative medicine tries to use the body to heal itself. Dr. Molly Shoikat's research primarily focuses on regenerating spinal cord nerves. Although the spinal cord is technically not an organ, it is a vital extension of one, the brain. The strategy that we're using for spinal cord injury repair and regeneration is we're trying to take the body's own cells and promote those cells to regenerate. So we're not adding new cells, uh, we're just providing stimuli to those cells that already exist to grow again. In a serious spinal cord injury, the spinal nerves are severed, preventing them from transmitting messages between the brain and other parts of the body. To repair this problem, Dr. Shoiket is pioneering methods of regenerating the severed spinal nerves. What we're doing is putting in a nerve guidance channel that will provide a pathway for regeneration. 
Nerve guidance channels are tube-like structures that direct nerve endings where to grow, helping them reconnect to other nerve endings. Molecules injected into these nerve guidance channels promote regeneration. This nerve guidance channel is made from something that is key to organ regeneration. Three-dimensional materials called scaffolds, which provide stem or tissue cells with a biodegradable surface on which to grow. I think of it as a fence. You know, if you're trying to climb over something, the mesh work on a fence gives you something to grab onto. Our scaffolds have all of those holes or pores connected. And that's really important because we want cells to grow all the way through them. Dr. Kimberly Woodhouse is trying to design the ideal scaffold for regenerating organs. Stem cells introduced into the scaffolding would be allowed to grow initially in the laboratory. Then the polymer structure would be implanted in the patient, where it would undergo gradual degradation while healthy tissue forms, eliminating the need for multiple operations on the patient. We can design scaffolds that are made from what people would generally call synthetic. The other way that we can make scaffolds is to actually use plants and to use um, bacteria to produce, for example, a human protein that we could then build into a scaffold. One challenge facing Dr. Woodhouse is getting cells to grow a sufficient supply of blood vessels in an organ. All the cells that you want to try to grow need to have oxygen, food brought to them and it has to be brought very, very close. So you have to have those blood vessels because that's how the food gets in to support a, um, a cell. Dr. Michael Sefton's research focuses on regenerating the supply of blood vessels in organs grown in the laboratory. We have a number of different approaches, some using materials that cause blood vessels to grow almost by magic, and others by using the cells that actually line blood vessels. One way scientists are training cells to form blood vessels is with a piece of equipment invented by NASA called a bioreactor. The bioreactor helps culture and regulate cell regeneration by providing a closed, controlled environment. Its rotating walls offer enough agitation to neutralize gravity and allow cells to grow uniformly on the entire scaffold. Um, what a bioreactor allows you to do is really closely control the environment of the cell with the hypothesis that by controlling this environment we'll be able to influence the decisions that cells make and to grow them better. Essentially, any organ in the body could be grown this way since they all begin at the cellular level. Almost every part of the body is, is an organ. The body is made up of cells and then growing up into tissues and then growing up and those tissues are assembled to form organs. The skin is an organ and even the bones uh, are in a sense an organ. If you have a burn wound, a surgeon will normally do what's called an autograft, which is take skin from one area of the body and put it on the other. But if you have a large burn, for example, you wouldn't have that tissue available. What we're trying to do is stimulate your skin cells to regenerate. While the field of regenerative medicine is a relatively new one, Research scientists are optimistic that it one day will open doors to a whole new approach to healthcare. 20, 30 years from now, there will be an unlimited supply of body parts, skin, bone, cartilage. So I think people won't be concerned if body parts wear out, they'll be replaceable. Somebody who's, who's had a spinal cord injury, a car accident, the spinal cord will be regrown and replaced and they'll be able to get up and walk again. I could see us coming, replacing different parts of the brain for different functions. So for example, in Parkinson's patients, um, there have been a lot of strategies that would fall into the sphere of regenerative medicine. For people like Chris Dujardin, regenerative medicine would mean more than restoring an organ. It would mean restoring their quality of life. If the doctors approached me and said, from your cells, we can culture a kidney. For me, that'll be the base, the, probably the best thing that could possibly happen. Don't know when, but I believe it will happen one day.
While regenerative medicine is an attempt to use the body to cure itself, researchers are also combining more traditional sources of healing with the wonders of 21st century science. About one quarter of all prescription medicines come from plants that already exist in nature. But in the search for cures to some of the planet's most insidious diseases, bioengineers are looking to create a whole new species that is part plant and part human. Welcome to the pharmacy of the future. These are tobacco plants, but there's no danger of them ever causing cancer. In fact, these particular plants have been genetically modified to heal. They could well be part of the next generation of prescription medicine, providing cures for some of the world's most serious diseases. In 20 years, there will be treatments available that, first of all, aren't available today, that are better than what's available today, in terms of side effects, in terms of invasiveness, and at cost levels that, that, that make them accessible. The door to that future could be something known as biofarming, the use of genetically altered plants to mass produce the human proteins found in our most common biological drugs. It turns out that there's a lot of protein-based drugs that people are aware of, but they're just not aware that they're a protein. And a good example would be insulin. The top selling Biodrugs are proteins, and uh, their sales uh, are in the billions of dollars. That billion dollar price tag is due partly to the difficult and costly process of producing these valuable proteins in large quantities. Dr. Tony Jevnikar understands the problem firsthand. As head of the kidney transplant program at London, Ontario's Health Sciences Centre, he was researching the protein molecule MHC, a vital cog in the body's immune response system. Dr. Jevnikar believed that MHC could help prevent the rejection of organ and tissue transplants. The problem was, he didn't have enough of the protein to do his research. Fortunately, I had read a very interesting article about tobacco plants producing an antibody and that the plant made the, the protein, this antibody, uh, at huge amounts. And so I linked up with uh, Dr. Shang Wu Ma. And Dr. Ma was a, um, a molecular plant molecular biologist with Agriculture Canada. And uh, I said, I presented him with this plan to make these MHC proteins and we put it into the tobacco plant and all of a sudden this tobacco plant started producing buckets of this MHC. The procedure involves a complex process of bioengineering known as transgenics. The DNA of the MHC protein was extracted from animal tissue and introduced into the genetic makeup of the tobacco plant. The result? A transgenic plant able to produce enough MHC protein for Dr. Jevnikar's clinical studies. After we did the MHC and the GAD, uh, we knew that there were other proteins that we could produce. And that's when I initiated contact with uh, Jim Brandle at Agriculture Canada. So one of the first proteins that the Brandle group actually produced was this protein called interleukin-10. Interleukin-10 is an important human protein that helps the body regulate inflammation a kind of molecular aspirin. Well, we've taken the gene for that molecule and introduced it into tobacco, and ta tobacco is able to produce the, a biologically active form of the molecule that's identical to that that's produced in humans. We work exclusively with tobacco. The materials we produce are, are going to be biologically active in humans. They're, they're drugs, and they shouldn't be part of the food chain. And in order to ensure that they aren't part of the food chain, uh, tobacco is a very wise choice. To make the tobacco plants transgenic, Brandel infects them with bacteria engineered to transfer a specific gene into individual plant cells. These cells are then used to regenerate new plants that actually carry the gene he wants to work with. The introduction of, of DNA into plants is essentially a natural process. The, 
all that's happened is we've substituted the genes that the agrobacterium is used for ones that uh, we're interested in using. So we've essentially harnessed a process that already existed in nature and, and uh, changed it slightly so that it could benefit man. One clear benefit of transgenic plants is the much lower cost of producing important drug proteins such as interleukin-10. The current catalog price for interleukin-10 is around $85 a microgram and with our system we can produce about a gram in hectares, so that's about $85 million uh, worth of, of interleukin-10 in, in 10,000 square meters of land. Although interleukin-10 is still under clinical investigation, researchers believe this important protein will be instrumental in treating a range of diseases in the future. We have not shifted our focus from our original interests, and those are diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and transplant rejection. There, there is a whole list of autoimmune diseases that potentially could benefit from this sort of approach like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, you know, thyroiditis is growing, perhaps even sort of asthma. 20 years, I think you're going to see extremely refined technologies. We'll be able to get plants to do very, very specific things with limited impact on the whole plant's growth and physiologies. And all of that knowledge, we'll be able to harness that to, to further refine our ability to produce uh, biopharmaceuticals and vaccines and things like spider silk in plants. Spider silk from plants? If you think that sounds far-fetched, how about that same spider silk from the milk of your friendly neighborhood goat? The transgenic animals um, we feel have a bright future in medicine and the main reason for that is what they represent the final stages of an operation. Surgeons begin to suture the incisions made during the procedure. Nylon and polypropylene are the most commonly used materials for surgical silk. In their constant search for new and improved technology, research scientists are turning to biofarming for more than a better way to produce prescription medicine. They are also hoping to develop stronger, more flexible material for surgical sutures. Once again, they set their sights on Mother Nature and the substance widely recognized as the ideal choice. Spider silk is, has been considered by many people in the textile industry to be the holy grail of material sciences. The spider silk is essentially um, a long polymer, which is sort of many, many protein molecules built together. Spider silk is an incredible material because it has two properties. It's strong and it's also elastic. And there's a fact that <clears throat> spider silk doesn't actually break under its own weight until it's stretched out for 80 kilometers. Just as impressive as the quality of spider silk is the quantity a spider can produce. Spiders can quite easily, at one time, produce a thousand feet of silk without, without even thinking about it. It's basically an indefinite process. As long as they have food and have the energy, they can produce silk. That's how they milk them, eh? Humans have used spider silk for medicinal reasons for, for a long, long time, uh, specifically for wound care, because um, spider silk, if, if layered on top of each other, is quite soft, and so it, it can be applied to a wound uh, and, and like a dressing, basically. The problem is, scientists have tried to harvest silk from spiders, but have always failed. Unlike cattle, spiders are highly territorial and cannibalistic. They're predators, so they're not easy to farm. That's why we, have, we haven't seen a, a huge uh, advancement in the use of spider silk. How do you get a lot of spider silk from spiders? That's, that's, the, uh, that's the real question. Canadian research scientists may have the answer, a unique solution for the mass production of spider silk. A goat farm in rural Quebec. Residents while away the day, grazing and producing milk. But these goats are far from ordinary. Like the tobacco grown at the University of Western Ontario, they are products of modern transgenic technology. 
with a spider gene implanted in their DNA, they have evolved into a new species, a spider goat. The facility is owned and operated by Nexia Biotechnologies. Nexia is a company that uh, has a, a business premise based around something we call biomimicry. The concept of learning from Mother Nature, uh, the concept of saying the products exist in nature. We needed an unusual manufacturing system, something that would allow us to do things that uh, before now wasn't possible. What Nexia has made possible is a kind of living factory, goats that manufacture spider silk in their udders. To produce the highest quality silk, Nexia had to find the perfect spider. There are more than 35,000 types of spiders, but within that plethora of spiders, there's a small group called the orb weavers. They make these beautiful webs and uh, of truly remarkable material. Those are the spiders we use. Once the perfect spider species was selected, the next step was to find the perfect dairy animal. Cows were considered, but goats fit the bill. These are dwarf goats, only 22 inches from hoof to horn. And what's remarkable about these goats is that uh, uh, they do breed early uh, when they reach sexual maturity at three to five months of age. And uh, they produce milk very, very quickly. And so by choosing the right goat, uh, you can make a lot of uh, difference. And certainly by choosing the sp right spider, you make a lot of difference. The process involves taking a silk-making gene from a spider's DNA and putting it in a single-celled goat egg. The egg is then artificially inseminated into a surrogate goat that gives birth to transgenic offspring. The offspring grows up to sexual maturity, gets pregnant, and starts making milk. That's how we get the product. The first time we see spider silk, it's in a white fluid that we know is milk. Once the spider silk protein is extracted from the milk, it is run through a needle that simulates a spider's spinnerets. As those individual proteins move through that tiny hole, reminiscent of the rear end of a spider, the spinnerets of a spider. Those proteins touch, they nucleate, and they form a continuous filament, a water-insoluble filament. The thread is stretched and spun as if by a spider itself, aligning the silk proteins in crystalline form. The result is biosteel, spider silk that is five times stronger than steel, yet 30 times more flexible than nylon. It is a product that will have significant impact on the future of surgery. Medicine, wound closure systems, uh, sutures or stitches, need something that's really, really thin and really strong. Well, think about Mother Nature. That's what spiders do. They needed to evolve a filament that was so fine that a bug wouldn't see it, and yet strong enough to absorb the energy of the bug crashing into the web. A surgeon commonly corrects a hernia by placing a surgical mesh in the patient's muscular wall to prevent internal organs from protruding. Although current technology in this area is adequate, surgical meshes made from biosteel would have an added benefit. They are biodegradable. Many of the materials that are used in hernia repair mesh, uh, for example, in polypropylene, are permanent. Where we envision biosteel to have unique advantages is once the patient is healed, the material goes away. It's uh, not necessarily a good thing for the human body to have a foreign material in it for an extended period of time. Nexia also plans to develop high-performance artificial ligaments made from biosteel. When a ligament is ruptured, a surgeon ordinarily has to replace it with a section of healthy tendon that's taken from the patient. Spider silk could be useful things like repairing your knees or shoulders or things along that line, where there's a lot of twisting moment, where you need that flexible strength. Biosteel as a product is still a couple of years away, but its possible applications are very exciting. What about casts? I mean, maybe you can develop a, 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 an elastic, a cast that you can actually move because it's because of the properties of spider silk, but still has the strength, but still has more mobility than what we think of as, uh, as, a, as a cast now. The promise of transgenic technology for the future seems limited only by our imaginations. The concept of biomimicry, the, the use of plants, animals, bacteria, etc., offer an opportunity to us, offer a bright future for us to be able to have a sustainable manufacturing system, still have 
wonderful new products that will, will do everything that we need. And yet when you're finished with them, you throw them in your compost pile and they break down. And that's the future we want to give to our children. Medical science has always turned to Mother Nature for answers to its questions. What she is unable to provide, technology finds ways to create. Even now, new technologies are expanding our knowledge and our horizons. Whether it's biofarming or biomimicry, transgenics or stem cell transplantation, science will continue to manipulate and reinforce Mother Nature as they move into the future together.